Yes, in a matter of months, the summer transfer window will reopen and Celtic and Neil Lennon will once again be tasked with improving the first team squad at the club. Of course, there's a bit of a caveat to this summer window in that we don't know what season we're planning for. Is it the current season? Is it next season? We don't know what's going to happen with certain players. We don't know whether we're looking at an immediate start of football, whether football will have started at that stage, where we'll even know if football is going to restart at that stage. It's all up in the air at the moment. But one thing that we do know is that Celtic will have to improve the squad for future challenges wherever they lie. Now, you may remember recently we did a video looking back at the last 10 summer transfer windows and picking out the very best signings Celtic have made in each of those markets. We spoke about the likes of Virgil van Dijk, Victor Wanyama, Odson Edward, Moussa Dembele. Well, it's not always been as positive as maybe that video made out. We have had the odd dud, probably one or two every single year. And that's the topic of today's video on the 67 Hail Hail channel on YouTube as we take a look back at the worst signing Celtic have made in each of the last 10 summer windows. Now it's worth saying that we are keeping it two summer windows so there's some obvious names that maybe spring out to you from January windows, that's why we've not included them. Because we're going into a summer window we want to keep it strictly to that and as I say we're going to take a look back at the last 10 seasons starting with the most recent and working our way back all the way to Neil Lennon's first proper transfer window. Right, let's get into it. Right, summer 2019. Now, again, another caveat I'll put in quickly. You're probably immediately thinking Marion Schwed. Of course, that's when he joined the club last summer. He'd be an obvious winner, probably, of this award, given the, the little impact he's made at the club. But the fact he was actually signed six months prior to that with the infamous Brendan Rodgers comments on already having about a million wingers at the club, we're not including him on this part. We're going to go instead for Moritz Bauer. Now it probably does say a lot about Neil Lennon and the recruitment team's business he did in the summer that Bowers considered the worst of the signings because he's certainly nowhere near as bad as some of the players we'll come on to later on in this video. Um, he was signed on loan from Stoke. He's probably been a victim of the fact that he's had, you know, Jeremy Frimpong and Hatemel Hamed having such a good impact and playing so well at right back. He's played 13 times in total for his Bower. He made little impact um, and he'll almost certainly go back to Stoke City. However, he does have, you know, some decent memories. He seemed quite a likeable guy and he did manage to get Jordan Jones sent off in one of his first ever acts in a Celtic shirt. So I suppose he and the Celtic support will always have that to remember. Previous year, Brendan Rodgers' final summer window and in came the debatable talent of Yusuf Malumbu. Now, he'd had a decent career down south with the likes of West Brom and he'd also played quite well for Kilmarnock the previous season. But saying that, there was massive questions asked at the time of the signing by the Celtic support. It came just probably a couple of weeks after we'd failed in the long, long pursuit of John McGinn when he went down to Aston Villa and it did seem like the signing of Malumbu was pretty much a panic buy and to be honest it turned out that way. He went on to play just three times for the club, made his debut away to Kilmarnock, he got wound up in that game, lucky not to get sent off for a couple of battles in a, a game we lost, quite a damaging defeat at the time. He's also probably quite well known for coming on in a, a pretty famous victory over Red Bull Leipzig and having possibly one of the worst substitute performances we've ever seen. He just came on to try and shore things up as we led 2-1 and he gave the ball away every time he got it, basically. It's worth saying that he is still looking for a club since leaving us. He's played, you know, trial periods at certain clubs, but I think that probably says a lot that Yusuf Malumbu has been unable to find a club basically since leaving Celtic and it's fair to say that that kind of summed up Brendan Rodgers' recruitment. Now the summer of 2017 was a pretty positive one for the club. Under Brendan Rodgers, much better than 2018 anyway. We brought in the likes of Olivier and Cham permanently. We brought in Odson Edward for his first ever loan spell at the club. So some really good signings there along with Johnny Hayes as well who have gone on to make a good name at the club. However, it's fair to say that the man we're going to talk about now, Could Die Benue, certainly hasn't had much of an impact at the club. We're not really sure what Brendan Rodgers saw in him. Perhaps he wanted to make him into another Raheem Sterling or a Coutinho, a player, you know, who not too many folk knew about, who would turn out to be a world beater. It just wasn't really for happening. He made a lot of early appearances, well, a few anyway, but his last appearance wasn't since August 2017 away to Kilmarnock, so he's really struggled, you know, to, to make any impact since then. Of course, he's been away out on loan in Sweden with Helsingborg, Henrik Larsson's old club didn't work for him at all 
and yeah, he's back now. He's still got a year to go in his contract, amazingly, and he's just another one of these players, along with the likes of Jack Hendry and others that were left with after Brendan Rodgers. I mean, Rodgers did a lot of good for the club, but he signed a lot of crap as well. Another feature of Rodgers' recruitment was that it did get worse and worse season after season. So 2016, his first summer, his rebuilding summer, was probably the best of the lot. The well-documented arrivals of Scott Sinclair, Moussa Dembele, even Colo Touré had a big impact at the club in his first six months, but Doris De Vries didn't really work out. He just got player of the year at Nottingham Forest down south. The hope was that he'd come in and he'd be this ball player who could start attacks for us with Craig Gordon Field. He was brought in as Gordon's replacement, and we ended up just reverting back to Gordon. Um, De Vries wasn't the shot stopper that the former Hearts keeper was. He was regularly seen flying through the air and spectacular goals always seemed to go in against him. You think of Koulibaly's goal for Kilmarnock and the goals Zenit scored in our second leg Europa League game a bit further down the line. He had a habit of making outrageous dives but getting nowhere near the ball. He was maybe a bit better with his feet than Gordon but if you're not saving the ball then what's the point in having a goalkeeper really? Of course, one positive that he can name De Vries from his time at Celtic was playing in the 5-1 victory over Rangers at Celtic Park. That was the one when the belly netted a hat-trick. Summer 2015 wasn't the best of transfer windows and to be honest, I could have probably picked any of four or five names here. I could have had Nadia Chiefji, I could have had Scott Allen, I could have had Sadie Yanko, but I'm going for another fullback. I'm going to go for Tyler Blackett just because of the reputation he had. He came from Man United, he played a few games for Man United, unlike Yanko, he was, I'm not going to say a household name at Man United, but he was certainly known by the Red Devils support, but it just didn't work out, despite him having decent expectations among the Celtic support. He only played eight games for the club, but it seemed like a lot more, which probably sums up just how bad he was in the hoops. And to be honest, his signing and his performance has really just summed up that final season under Dyla. We don't know who signed him. Was it a Dyla signing? Was it the scouting department, the recruitment department? But whatever the case, it was just indicative of what happened in that final season under Dyla. He was a decent sized name. The likes of Colin Kazim Richards and Carrollton Cole spring out as similar ones, but just had no hunger to succeed at the club. And the hunger comment probably applies to our choice from the summer window of 2014. It was Alexander Tonev. Now, when you talk about Celtic, Aston Villa and Bulgaria, immediately you think of Stan Petrov and happy memories probably. Well, sadly, Tonev couldn't live up to the Bulgarian name in Glasgow because he was an undoubted flop. He made more headlines for off-the-field stuff in terms of the alleged racist abuse of Aberdeen fullback Shea Logan. But that stuff probably better not spoken about, but Tonev on the pitch was an absolute failure. He offered, you know, nothing over his time at the club and probably if you were to look at signings that we made and would like to unsign over the past 20 years or so, I think Alexander Tonev would probably be pretty high in that list. And he'd be joined by another winger that we signed the previous year. You may have forgotten the name, Dirk Berigter. Now he joined from Ajax, Decent sized things were expected of him, he'd been in the Dutch national squad for a couple of games, he'd never got a cap and he has never got a cap, but big things were expected when we shelled out a whopping 3 million, which is a lot of money at the time, from Ajax for him. We badly needed a left winger and you know, things started so well, that famous debut against Ross County, the evening game, the first game of the season on the Saturday night, played really well, he looked good down the left wing until disaster struck. We'd been told about his injuries and the fact that he couldn't string two games together and it proved to be the case. He was rarely seen after that. He made a couple of appearances but he never really got over those injury problems and he turned out for £3 million to be a whopping waste of space and a waste of money. And since leaving Celtic in April 2016, he has not been seen playing football for any other club. So we've been his last club. That probably speaks volumes. 2012's flop and we spoke about him on a recent video looking at all the, oh, the number sevens since Henrik Larsson. He is of course the Venezuelan striker Miku and I'll just get it out of the way straight away. Yes, he played against Barcelona, he was part of that team and well done to him for that but we cannot not call him a flop just because of one evening in the Champions League when yeah, he led the line well, but he didn't exactly score against Barca. He didn't exactly create anything against Barca. He did OK against Barca, but OK is not something you could probably call the rest of his Celtic career because arriving on loan from Getafe, he scored a decent amount of goals in La Liga. 
not going to say massive things were expected, but we're certainly hoping for something from him and he just turned out to offer us very little. He scored two goals, you probably remember one of them, it was a way to Dundee United in a game that we drew two each and it was a really well taken goal but other than that he offered us so little at the club. He got more yellows than goals, he got three of them and to be honest he's someone who we don't remember particularly fondly albeit he did play that one game that I've already mentioned. But he's well ahead of another striker who we signed who was just absolutely awful in 2011. Mohamed Bangura, he cost us 2.2 million somehow. The biggest waste of money you can probably ever think. He arrived from AIK, our Europa League opponents, earlier this season. And he just awful. Um, probably the worst striker I've seen at the club, certainly in the last 20 years. I don't know, maybe you can let me know in the comments if there has been a worst striker. And then to make matters worse, he then appeared for Elfsborg against us in Champions League qualification while he was still in our books. It was a UEFA rule that you can't, you know, forbid players playing against you. Thankfully, he didn't score in that tie, but he did start at Celtic Park and that would have just been the, the absolute ending to the crisis if he had scored against us. Thankfully, that didn't happen, but it's hardly surprising because let's just say goals weren't exactly his forte. Now, the summer of 2010 was a pretty positive one, probably similar to the summer of 2019 in that Neil Lennon was building his squad. In came household names, the likes of Joe Ledley, Gary Hooper, Anthony Stokes, Emilio Ezeguiri, players that Neil Lennon could hang his hat on for following years. However, the same couldn't be said about Efrain Juarez, although he did arrive perhaps with the biggest reputation given that he just played for Mexico at the 2010 World Cup. To make matters even better at the time, he looked really good in the Emirates Cup. He also scored goals and played well in some of our early European qualifiers against the likes of Braga and Utrecht. But he never really kicked on for that. It's a real shame. His temperament clearly had issues. He had issues when he was playing for Mexico and it seemed to manifest into his Celtic stuff as well. Neil Lennon could clearly never trust him despite him having undoubted quality and he really went down as a bit of a flop given that we'd played three million pounds for him that kind of has to make him number one for 2010. However he does have you know the nice end to the story that he's now based with another couple of Celts with New York City in the MLS. He's the assistant manager to Ronnie Dyla despite never playing under Ronnie Dyla at Celtic. They've just met somehow and obviously Gary mckay Steven out there as well. So that's always good to see. That gives him some positive marks. But in terms of his Celtic career, it just never worked for Juarez. Right, there we go. Hopefully we've restored a bit of faith in Celtic's transfer dealings about them being absolutely terrible at times. Yes, chances are we'll sign someone really good this summer, but there's also probably someone that won't go on to do as well, but maybe that's just the joys of the transfer window. We really appreciate you watching this video again. Who do you want to see us sign this summer? Let us know who we should sign, where we should look to strengthen. And also, we're asking who is the biggest dud you have seen us sign in the last 20 years. We've probably mentioned them already in this video, but maybe it was a January acquisition as well. Let us know in the comments below. While you're doing that, if you've not yet subscribed, we'd really appreciate that. Tell a pal about us, like our videos, click the bell next to the subscribe button and stay in touch with 67 Hail Hail on Twitter. We're at 67 Hail Hail Facebook. You can search 67 Hail Hail and all of that kind of stuff. So we really appreciate your support once again. Hopefully we'll speak to you soon.